welcome to my discussion of the application of Coulomb's law to covalent bonding. It's a little bit, I think, of an unusual application of Coulomb's law, but I think a very helpful application of Coulomb's law. So let's take a look at that. Uh, Coulomb's law is, is about attraction or possibly repulsive forces. Repulsive forces would go up like that. Um, as two atoms come close together, now their inner or core electrons really have no impact on this conversation. But as they come close together, their valence electrons start to interact. Ionic, there's a transfer of those valence electrons. With covalent, what we're talking about is a shearing situation. So as those two atoms, and don't forget when you're talking about Coulomb's law, I'm talking about it in the sense of potential energy, all right, um, is going to be proportional to one over the distance. So as atoms get closer and closer together, you notice that potential energy is becoming negative. That's because a negative potential energy, here we're dealing with our negative electrons, is going to make it negative. We're not doing mathematics with this, so I'm not getting um, too hung up on this. The point I want to make is that as they get closer together, they're forming attractive forces. And that's going to give us a negative potential energy. Negative potential energy, the more negative it is, the more attractive. So you want to talk about it in terms of being more negative or lower, or less negative and higher, not bigger or smaller. It, that gets really confusing and muddies up the water and doesn't convince someone you know what you're talking about. So we can talk about higher or lower, or we can talk about as more negative or less negative. Okay, They ultimately, the two atoms, like let's say it's um, two fluorine atoms getting closer together. And they reach what I like to call this sweet spot, which is their bond length. Okay, their bond length. And it's an average bond length. And the reason we call it an average bond length is because atoms vibrate. So the fluorines are moving away from each other and then back closer to one another over time. And so they vibrate. And there's an energy involved in this vibration. And this is key. You need to know this if you're AP and IB. And I would think general chem too. I've taught general chem and I would certainly point this out. Uh, because infrared spectroscopy is such an important tool in chemistry, we would study that in the IR region. It's not as much energy as it takes to promote electrons or to ionize, um, but it's still a very measurable and important region of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. So that's the infrared region measures bond vibrations. Okay, so that's very, very important. So this would give us our average bond length. Well, if they get too close together, they start ex very quickly experiencing repulsive forces. It's sort of like a relationship. A healthy relationship is in this sweet spot. Um, as you get far apart, you can become distant and not so close. But if you get too close together, it starts to become unhealthy. And that's what is happening here. They start to experience repulsive forces as their uh, electron clouds are overlapping too much. So I wanted to apply that in that sense, but I also want to show you what would happen as we change bonds. Now, the distance is going to be the radius of one atom plus the radius of another atom. So if we had atom A and atom B, so that would be our second atom, that it would be the, the overlapping radius between the two. 
would be our bond distance. That's how we would estimate uh, that bond distance. So if we go from a single bond to a double bond to a triple bond, and let's compare this for elements that are in the same period. I'm just going to do this qualitatively. So we could talk about nitrogen and oxygen and fluorine. <clears throat> if I had to do an estimation of this, let's call this the oxygen atom here. Well, our oxygen atom okay, uh, it has a double bond in it. All right? And so it has a particular bond distance, and the energy to break the double bond, both bonds, not just the pi bond. Um, don't look at these numbers. I'm just using this qualitatively. Um, this would be the average bond energy. This would be the energy it takes to break. Okay. Now, let's take a look if I would have, say, fluorine. I'll put fluorine in blue. Okay. A single bond is longer so we know it's going to shift in this direction and a single bond and this is assuming somewhat similar sizes in the atoms you would have to consider differences in say hydrogen which is very very tiny okay uh, would be a different argument than fluorine okay I'm, I'm talking about within the same period it's going to be longer and it's also going to be weaker it will take less energy to break. So takes less energy to break. So that means it's going to go up this way as well. So what fluorine would look like is the length is going to be less, that kind of sweet spot. Okay, and it's going to take less energy. It's going to have a less negative potential energy so a less negative potential energy, so less energy is required to break it. Okay, let's shift the conversation to then nitrogen, which has a triple bond. If I'm looking at the strength of that whole triple bond, not just the individual pi bonds and sigma bonds, and if you haven't talked about that yet, we're just looking at this whole triple bond to break. Okay, it's going to be shorter because as you increase the electron density between the two atoms, it's going to pull the atoms closer. Okay, so for nitrogen, we're going to shift to the left, which is a closer distance between the two. That means it's also going to take more energy to break. So nitrogen is going to come down lower and to the left and go up higher. Okay, so that would give you kind of a relative. So that would be a triple bond, the double bond, and comparing a single bond with fluorine. Whoops, I didn't mean to get a highlighter there. Sorry about that. Fluorine. Okay, again, assuming the atoms are roughly the same size. If they were in different periods, then you would have to consider that along with the conversation. Um, so you'd have to consider the size of the atoms, the size of the atoms, as well as the bond. This would be called the um, bond order. So we might be a little ahead of where you are in class, but the bond order, loosely speaking, one, two, three. Okay? So, hope that helps you out. Thanks for joining me.